Hello, it's okay. You guys can listen to me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so good afternoon. We, today we would like to continue to talk about the processes that are shaping diversity. And in this course, we focus on ecological interactions, as I mentioned. Uh, not only because they are cool, but, be, but because there is no organism on Earth that live without interacting with other individuals of different, or the same or different species. So they, they will sometimes establish, uh, oh, I'm not doing it. <laughs> oh, and they are put their uh, mutualistic interactions, positive interactions among individuals. They will compete and fight for resources um, with individuals of the same species or with different, different species or they will interact with natural enemies that uh, may kill or just parasitize them like this is a nest parasite. So today we will focus on one of those interactions, the competitive interactions, more specifically the interactions, the competitive interactions among individuals of different species. And we see that this is a consequence of exponential growth of that, that, that potential that we saw le uh, yesterday, that every population on Earth of any, no matter animal, plant, or fungi have, that, that to explode in numbers if his, his sources are not limited. So this is implies that even if you look to that landscape, that is thousands of different uh, herbivores, most of them wild beasts, if you have animals that use these resources, like lions and hyenas, they will compete. If nothing is in, if there is no, no process controlling them in such a way, no matter how abundant is the resource, given enough time, and not, it's not a long time period, given enough time, they will compete. And so interspecific competition is an interaction among or between individuals of different species that leads to a fitness decrease in both interacting individuals. So fitness is the coin, the main currency in biology, in evolutionary biology as well, is essentially uh, usually described as the product of fecundity uh, times survival, isn't it? Like you do that through the entire life of the individual, you compute the fitness of a given individual. Okay? You, we measure that in many ways, in many different ways, survival, health, uh, state, uh, state uh, fecundity, we can measure that. So the question, what we will do this in this lecture is to Im uh, image the world if competition is the driving force shaping diversity. If competition among species in a given site is shaping the distribution of species. So what would, how the world would be if competition is the leading force. So I will first uh, it starts from the first principles, although this idea is, is much newer than the, the ecological thinking on competition, I will start assuming a very simple uh, word, that I, let's call neutral words. Uh, we assume neutrality. I will explain that brief, uh, briefly in, in a moment. But you see how as the patterns that we should expect if there is nothing acting to define which is the winner in a competitive interaction. Then we will break the assumption of equivalence among individuals, the symmetry among individuals of different species. And to do so, I need to introduce or, or, he, he, um, or we just remember this concept of niche. What is the niche? of a, a given individual, of a given species. And then this will lead to, um, to the world in which species vary in their competitive abilities. This will be the niche-based world. I will finish with a brief sum summary and some references 
for, for further reading if you guys are interested on. And at the end of the day, we will have the notion of, about the neutrality as a concept that can help us out to understand patterns on nature. This is uh, another way of applying the notion that, that, that one fundamental benchmark in science is what happens when nothing happens with a system, like the first, the Newton's first law, or Hart-Weinberg law, or the Malthusian, the exponential growth in populations. Then we will see the conditions in which we expect competition to shape biodiversity, and I will finish. Uh, um, I hope that at the end we have some ideas on, on how competi competitors can coexist in ecological communities. So let's start with uh, a neutral word. Just a moment. You know, you get old and now you need two glasses. <laughs> and, and for me, you guys are looking like an impressionist picture right now. <laughs> what is quite cool, I mean, I like impressionists. I, I took me like 18 years to realize that the world was not impressionist. <laughs> the first time I used glasses, I said, oh my God, everything is so sharp, defined. Oh, now it's like that. <laughs> yeah, better. So let's start with the comp competition in the neutral world. So we all know that organisms on nature vary in their features, what we call phenotypes, isn't it? This is true within species. Look, look among us. There is this beautiful diversity. Now I can see better. Uh, this beautiful diversity of, uh, of traits that you guys have. And this is even more evident when you look across the species, isn't it? Like uh, trees, <laughs> animals, hyenas and lions and lionesses, they vary a lot in their, in their features. Like for example, lions and lionesses, they vary, they, they, they are yet heavier than I am. What is, a, is, what is my usual measure of weight, like it's 0 0.1 ton. And the hyenas are not so, so big, they all, but lions create groups that, that have their, have a small number of individuals compared to hyenas. Uh, the collective, do you know how is the collective name for a, a group of lions and lionesses? Pride, pride of lions. That's a pride, yeah. That's, I, li I love that. This is, this is this, the one thing that I think that the English got correctly, how to create no, cool names for groups of animals, <laughs> like a murder of crows. This is a good name. <laughs> In Portuguese, we call everything bandos. We do have other names, but just for a few, few species. Lions and lionesses operate in open habitats. Usually, hyenas don't care. They move around the forest habitats, wooded habitats, open areas. So they vary a lot. But for a start, you just assume that those, oops, those differences are irrelevant. Okay? As a biologist, for me, this is not okay at all. <laughs> because we biologists are, we are in love with the differences, with the diversity. We do not think, as usually people in physics think, that they are searching for generalities. Like Galileo playing balls on the, on, 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 throwing balls and see what happens with the balls. If, we were a bio if he was a biologist, he would just measure, okay, now it's a bit different, now a bit different. Oh, how, oh my God, how nice is different, the difference of the way the ball falls. We are in love with diversity in biology, and this is cool, but as a first approximation, I will assume that this is not relevant right now. That the variation that you observe in nature across individuals of different species does not play a role in determining the outcome of competitive interactions. Then later, we introduce the traits. 
And we, by doing so, we have a benchmark. We have this uh, benchmark that allow us to measure the nature and measure the effects that we observe in nature in terms of departures. Like you measure selection in population genetics as a departure from the hard Weinberg law. You measure something constraining the growth of a population as a departure from the exponential growth. This is a cool, you, you measure acceleration as a departure from Newton's first law. Okay, so you can have, you have a benchmark. That's the reason this idea was uh, championed by one field biologist called Hubble that worked with trees in Panama. So he was someone that was really aware of the importance of traits uh, in, 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 in determining the abundance of species. But he came up with this idea. He was not the only the first person. There is a lot of people that did that work, but he organized that in terms of what we call the neutral theory of biodiversity. So imagine that you have here a community and its symbol here is an individual. The colors are different species. So imagine the competition is quite strong here. Like, like this could be trees, they are fighting for space. There is no way to add a tree here, only if one other tree die. Out, die. If there is a, the death of a tree, then another tree could, could get to the place, okay? I'm talking about the individuals, I'm not talking about the species here. And let's assume that all the traits that differ across these species are, are irrelevant to the dynamics, to the ecological dynamics. This is the idea of neutrality. We are assuming that all individuals are ecologically, and here ecologically means demographically equivalent. So the probabilities of a given individual die is, or reproduce, they are constant. Okay, they don't vary, constant in the sense they do not vary across individuals of different species. A species are just tags that you add to a given individual. It's just the colors I add to the, my symbols there. They are not playing any role. So the, we are not saying that the individuals are equal. We are just saying that the, the differences are not relevant uh, in terms of fitness. Okay? And again, this is, just to remember, fitness is that currency that we use in evolution, but if there is no variation in fitness across individuals, there is no evolution at all, okay? It is not evolution driven by uh, natural selection. Okay, so we have here. And then I will kill this individual. Sorry, guy. So who, who would occupy this? place. Which species will occupy this place? Let's imagine those are trees. They are just throwing seeds over there. Who, who will occupy here if all individuals are equivalent? Anyone, isn't it? We could make this, this is spatial and say that people that are here are more likely to, to, to throw seeds here, but don't. Let's get rid of that. This will become very complicated. Let's assume that the dispersal is universal. Of course, we know there is not, not such thing as universal dispersal. We know that. But this is what we call simplifying assumption. It makes us to progress without take, take, take the address to tackle this complicated stuff, see what we get, and then we add the complicated stuff. Okay, so we simplify and go, and in some sense we are, we are imposing symmetries here, isn't it? Like we are assuming that the, the dispersal abilities of all individuals are equivalent. And every time you say something like that, that you create some symmetry in your system, it's easier to make the math. It's easy also to think, that you don't, here today I will not talk a lot about math, just to think get easier. So, can be anyone. 
this would be essentially a, a, a game of luck. And the first consequence of that, if you assume that you are in a closed community, there is no individuals arriving from over outside, is that you will generate what we call ecological drift. I mentioned briefly ecological drift yes, yesterday, but there, there is one important consequence of drift. Drift here is just the numbers goes up and down uh, by chance across time, okay? But if the community is isolated, if I do that and I keep go, go doing, at the end of the day, you end up eroding diversity. If the community is closed, like, let's go back. Here, I don't know the different frequencies, but by chance, if this is a closed community, I will substitute that with an individual from other, from other species. So all individuals are equivalent in the number of seeds they are producing. So the probability of a given species occupying the site is proportional to the number of individuals of that species in the community. Is that okay? So imagine that everybody, every species has exactly the same abundance. So at, at the f time equals zero, this probability will be equal across the species. But once this purple individual is substituted by a black one or a white one, then the abundances are not more equal. They are not equal anymore. And then you can a small advantage for like the black one or the red one or the white one. And then the, the, you continue this game, this small fluctuation in numbers will sometimes will decrease, but sometimes will increase. They will be highly unlikely, they will keep constant to time. It will be really, really unlikely in terms of prob probabilities. And at some point, one species will die out. Once a species goes extinct in a closed community, it cannot come, come back. So if you continue that, at, at given enough time, you erode completely the diversity of the system. You, feel, you end up with a single species in this, in this community. Of course, we know that ecological communities are not closed. They are open. But right now, this is what happens if you get rid also the, of dispersal. Okay? This has a, a very important implica in implication. Total dominance in a neutral world in, in which there is no dispersal as well, there is no selection, there is no speciation, in this world, you end up with a dominant species, a complete dominant species. But there is no difference among species in their competitive ab abilities. If this is true, therefore, dominance by itself is just a weak evidence of higher competitive abilities in a given species. The fact that a species is particularly abundant in a given site could be generated by chance. I'm not saying that is, oh, I'm not saying it is generated by chance. I'm saying that it can be reproduced, assuming that this was this, this occurred by chance. So that's why I'm saying that's a weak evidence to someone arguing that in that particular species, oh my God, this is so common in that place because it uses the resource really well, or is a, a strong competitor because it can dominate the resource and in in forbidding other species to use. No, sorry, this is, is, this is weak. Just dominance is weak. I need more. And one way of avoid the complete erosion of diversity is to incorporate the fact that communities are usually, almost always, open. Then you have dispersal come up, come up. So now we add a second process. This is dispersal. So ecological drift and dispersal. So what's going on? When you have both of things happening, disper dispersal adds diversity, brings the species 
back to the system. If you die, if one species die out in a place, then individuals of that same species can recolonize the place through migration. In addition, not novel species can arrive. Like today, this is a war that, that we are operating in the, in, with high rates of dispersal. Individuals are moving all over the place. And this is increased diversity. Usually we think in invasive species as something that decays diversity, and that's true as well, in the sense that some invasive species can destroy diversity, like rats or cats, those animals, or humans. Those, those animals can actually reduce diversity. But for most of cases, in species that are introduced in a given site does not imply in reduction, in reduction of diversity. For example, take for example New Zealand. New Zealand has originally three species of mammals that, that were nat native from New Zealand. Two of them are bats. Three of the, the three species are bats, but two of them are bats that just walk in the ground, seldom flying. Kind of odd bats. Today we have dozens of species of mammals living in New Zealand. The same is true for birds as well. Although the cool birds that evolved there, like the moas, that big birds, they die out. Today we have a higher diversity of birds living there because of the introduced species. So the effect of, we see in a moment, the, effects of, the, the, the basic effect of dispersal is increased diversity locally. Okay, as a general pattern. So dispersal will maintain or increase local diversity. It will counterbalance the effects of genetic drift. Oh, sorry, ecological drift. So let's see uh, with an example, and here I will this will help to introduce some concepts that are really keen for ecological, uh, to community ecology. So imagine that we have these four communities. Those are the species there. And then they are isolated and then we allow dispersal. So individuals are moving around. And imagine that you have a lot of dispersal going on. And if this is true, the first effect of dispersal is increased diversity, as I mentioned. But there is a second effect. The second effect is increasing homogeneity of diversity across space. Like I said today, uh, earlier, that this person is going on at huge rates right now, and the, you're increasing diversity. But the thing is that every place that you go in the, in the world now has the same diversity. Not exactly that, but you have some elements, like the pigeon, uh, that, like the sparrow, or pardal, these animals that are all over the place. So you have more species, but they are the same species. So here I will introduce some, some concepts uh, on community ecology that are to, uh, ways to describe diversity as we used it yesterday, but now describing also the variation across the space. So we call alpha diversity the local diversity of, of species. Here I measure diverse, diversity in terms of species richness, okay? So the local diversity is the alpha diversity. And there is something called gamma diversity, is that it, the total pool of species in a given region. Region is just a larger area than your site, okay? And local is your site. So that's the colors, again, are different species here. And then you can compute something that we call turnover or better diversity, and there is many ways, different ways of doing so. I hear that I, I use, without any a priori preference, I use this definition, all of them relates alpha with gamma. So it's essentially the change, how much of the diversity is due to the variation among sites. So it's not the diversity in terms of that particular site, is not the regional diversity, is the variation in diversity across sites. Okay?
So in this particular case, this gives you a number, 2.33, and just a number. But we can measure using that and see how things go up and down if we incorporate this parcel. So imagine that you incorporate this parcel, you, keep, you are keeping the gamma diversity in 10 species, but now your richness, local richness, local diversity, alpha diversity increases. Now, instead of three species per site, you have 5.25 species on average. And this implies that the turnover with the case, the different sites are more similar among each other in terms of species composition. Okay? So a way of characterize that is to play with alpha, gamma, and beta in, in, in such a way that you are computing how diverse is its structure. You are some, in some sort of, of analyzing uh, in which spatial scale diversity is its structure, isn't it? Like if each site is different, there is a lot of turnover. So diversity is its structure at the site level. But if all places you sample or have the same species, diversity is structured. In, a, in the level of the entire pool, the level of the region, the land, the continent in some cases. Now we add the third process, speciation, and this is the basis of what people call in the literature the neutral theory of biodiversity. There is speciation as well. So there is genetic drift, there is dispersal, and there is speciation. So it's neutral, but you allow uh, the fact that communities are open and that the species are being generated through time. And speciation entry, entry in a, enters in this model in a very particular way. It essentially adds to dispersal. And the reason beyond uh, underlying that, sorry, is that speciation events are quite rare. So if speciation events are rare, you are observing a given site, you see no speciation there because the speciation is rare. But if your site is small compared to like Amazon forest, in some point of the Amazon forest, there is some species is splitting right now. And so these new species will add to the pool of species that can arrive to your site. So this is the way speciation is incorporated in the neutral theory as a, a form of adding potential for dispersal. Okay, so this is a, a reasoning until now that we get rid of almost all biology. We add very few biological features of an ecological community. We, we add the fact that populations are finite and small. We, we add the fact that communities are open and we allow species to speciate. So this is almost nothing related to what we call ecological uh, interactions, isn't it? There is no traits, there is nothing going on. But there is competition, there is a lot of competition. So there is ecological interactions, but they are not mediated by traits. There is no morphology here. There is no functional biology, there is nothing. The classical biology there. So how good this theory reproduce empirical data. And then, again, this is not, not a question about what is happening in the real world. In the real world, there is a mess. There is a lot of things going on simultaneously. And of course, traits may play a role. But, but I should op opt for an uh, explanation that is as simple as possible. And in this case, I do, maybe I do not need to go to the details of the variation across the species to explain a pattern in nature. And this is true for the distribution of, of species abundance in, of trees in some high diverse places like Barro Colorado in Panama. This is a reserve uh, study site that, that most of the research done with for, tropical forest was done there. They follow the abundances of trees, and you end up with this classical distribution. This story again is Portuguese. Uh, so I rank the species from the most abundant to the less abundant. And we call this the rank order uh, abundance plot. 
And if you do that for almost any community in the entire world, you always get a qualitatively the same pattern. We have just a few species that are really abundant, and most of the species are rare. And the neutral theory is able to reproduce these species abundant distributions for trees, including the quantitative description of these, these distributions, the parameters of the distributions, in a, in a really, generates a really good fit. But okay, it's just one community, isn't it? Like it's, it's not because the, those guys are like decades studying trees that we should allow them to make big uh, statements based on, on a single observation. This is, is, is very unfair, but it's a statistic, statistically, this is, this is a, a, a reasonable criticism. So we, we zoom in. And now we study communities inside holes on trees in a forest. Those are not communities of trees, of course, but of bacteria. And if you look to the distribution of abundance uh, of this uh, species, abundance distribution of these of these communities, of many of, of many communities, you reproduce the distributions of, of this this species abundant distributions of bacteria across multiple communities using a, a, a neutral world, a neutral theory, we, a, neo, a, a dynamics that do not assume that traits are governing the outcome of competitive interactions. Just allowing this person incorporate the notion that speciation is going on in some place, is a competitive system, and there is a lot of ecological drift going on, okay? But there are patterns that we observe in nature that are not reproduced by neutral theory. And for those patterns, we need more. Not for species abundance distributions, but for these patterns, like why you have those particular combinations of resource, habitat, and then there is a species that occupy each combination with very few overlap among species. Oops. Or why sometimes the local diversity in phenotypes, here represented by different colors, the, clo the, the more similar the color, more similar the phenotype, okay? <laughs> usually is not a random, a random sample of the regional diversity of traits. There is some, something limiting the similarity of traits. This is also not predicted by neutral theory. Traits doesn't matter, so it should be a random sample. And finally, neutral theory does not pre predict continuous deterministic change in diversity as we observe in uh, ecological succession dynamics, in which we now have no random phenotypic patterns, not across space, but across time. For those patterns, we need more. We need to bring biology back. Any question? Yeah? Oh, it's here. Oh, is there as well? Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, just to be sure, I understood these things that you mentioned. A neutral theory can can't describe them as a matter of principle, right? So we could, from yeah. the get go, say, okay, this cannot. cannot. But there could be also things that it predicts that are just wrong, right? There, like you could there are questions that you can ask the theory. It gives an answer, and the answer is, is wrong. Yeah, that's true. Like is this also like? Are there good examples of that as well? Yeah. For example, neutral theory predicts extinction rates that are quite low. So that erosion of diversity will occur, but will take for a while. And you know, like in, in Bajo Colorado, if you measure the extinction rates of trees, because this story there it was, it was a, a mass of land, they created the, the, the channel. Now they have a bunch of islands there. And this you lead some species will die out because the populations are small, the conditions change. And so you measure the rate of extinction is much higher than predicted by neutral theory. 
But please note that the pattern I mentioned is still you can create like a sort of a benchmark, isn't it? Like I can measure how are I supposed to be the average overlap of trades among species if, if you are randomly sampled a community. And then you measure in nature and sometimes the local diversity of traits is higher than expected by chance. But, but expected by chance, I, I kind of hate that, that term because chance can, mean, can be many things, isn't it? Can be anything associated with a, ran, a distribution of a random variable. And there is many ways of doing a random variable distribution, isn't it? So actually you do have a benchmark. You have a benchmark that is generated by nothing happens in your system. There is nothing acting on that. So you can measure how strong is, like for example, selection, filtering out phenotypes by comparing with the prediction of something like the neutral theory. So that's, for me, that is the, the, the main usefulness of this kind of, of thinking. You actually have some what you expect. Like for people that work with evolution, like in evolutionary biology, it's trivial the fact that close related system, uh, species are more similar to each other. It's trivial, isn't it? Like, if you're assuming a branching process generates species, those species that branch, speciate a few million years ago, usually it will be more similar than those two species to a third species that speciate, like, hundreds of million, millions ago. That's correct? So the benchmark in evolutionary thinking is what we call Brownian motion. Traits are changing by chance. And once you have the branching process, the speciation process, now we have the traits are changing independently in both, in both lineages. And then you use that to compare, to measure, if there is something constraining trait diversification, some sort of develop, development or constraint or stabilizing selection, or if there is something pushing a species, sorry, pulling, oh my God, pulling a species uh, far away to each other, some diversification process going on, like competition implying in species to explore different niches, and you go to niche concept in a moment. So that's benchmark, that's benchmark use, use of theory is, is very important to get, to get insight about the process that actually, actually matters to, to shape the patterns that we are interested on. So let's go for the niche concept. So we are moving from dispersal, speciation, ecological drift, a, a world in which traits doesn't matter, to a word now that traits matter. And if traits matter and this define who are winning in your particular case competition, then we are moving to a word on selection, in which selection is, is, is a driving force. We can still have like dispersal, speciation, ecological drift, but let's keep things simple. Let's focus on selections in isolation. And the idea of niche is quite old. And it was, niche is that hole that you have on the church that you put the sand there, isn't it? Like you put the statue there. That is niche. And this guy, when he was describing the natural history of this board in California, at the end of the, uh, of the paper, it's a paper about natural history, he used the word of niche to describe where this species lives in terms of characteristics of of the site, and he came up with this idea. He just throw there. Two species cannot have the same niche. And this is a key insight. This is amazing. I mean, just throw that a sentence in the end of the discussion, almost without explanation. The notion of niche was used in many different ways, related but different ways, so Charles Elton who wrote with 27, in 1927 this amazing book, Animal Ecology. This is a fantastic book. It is uh, tons of ideas per page. It's impressive. It's really impressive. 
And there he used niche in a different way. He used niche as, a, as something of, that we would associate to the role of a species in the ecological plague, you know? Like here we have two reno, reno species. They have the black reno and the white reno. They are both gray. This is a, apparently is a wrong, wrong translation of Afrikaner. Uh, but the black reno feed upon leaves and twigs and things like that. And the white reno is a hyper uh, grass, uh, grass feeding animal. Like here, for us in Brazil, it's like a capybara. Okay, it's just feeding on grass, most of the time on grass. So they have different roles in the community. And then Hudson comes up in a very short essay, it's a very short essay, actually a comment on a conference, if I remember correctly, in 1957, he came up with a definition that is a much more mathy definition of niche. niche. And niche is the n dimensional hypervolume. Hypervolume is just a cool word for a volume that has more than three dimensions. Okay, nothing special. You cannot imagine your head, at least I can't, but you can do the math, isn't it? It's linear algebra, you can, you can do, it, do that. The defini by, that is defined by all factors limiting the occurrence of a given species. And these factors come in, comes into flavors conditions and resources. Conditions are aspects of the system that you cannot change. Humidity, temperature, salinity, light, for, for animals usually. And resources are, aspect, as, are features of the system that you can control, like food, like uh, places to, to, like shelters, places to, to get hidden, and for plants, light as well, isn't it? Because light is a resource, they, they can control the arrival of light uh, uh, to them, okay? So, and then we can measure. So here we have temperature, there we have the fitness, the relative fitness, and this is what people in biology do a lot, especially if you're an animal physiologist. You put a laser like that, and then you start to increase the temperature and, or decrease. And so it's okay, here he can live, but not do, performing well. Then it's increasing. Oh, here he has the max performer. Uh, and then if I get too hot, the individual dies. And so this is bad. The fitness is zero here, over there. Okay? So, and we usually, when we think about niche, much of the work is on temperature, on salinity, on water availability, and of course, food resources. And then we can combine that with different conditions, and then we can draw lines that describe in which combination of conditions the individual can actually reproduce, and the population growth can be positive. This is already the conditions in which the population can thrive, okay? So you can define the niche at the individual level, but then you can define the niche at the population level as well. And this will be, instead of reproduction, will be the persistence of a given population. So those are the main ideas of niche. So niche is related to the conditions and resources an individual or a species can use and, and su survive to that particular combination. And this will be affected by the traits the individual has. So the traits are the keys to understand what, why some individuals are able to make a living in a given site and other individuals are not. So to start the, the notion of what, what competition will do with a system in which you have differences in the competitive abilities of different individuals, we go back to the work of a microbiologist, Gauss. Gauss was creating those microorgan microorganisms in, in the lab, paramecium, and he had tried to put different strings of paramecium to coexist, and it was pretty hard to get there. And he was able to come up with idea, the same idea I mentioned before, 
uh, that two species with identical niches cannot coexist. If they are using the same resources, because the populations will increase at the beginning exponentially, and then we start to slow down because the resources are getting limited. If there is differences among species in their ability, the best competitor will outcompete the weak competitor, and they will not coexist. That is the insight that Gauss come up. And then, then ecologists, this, they, they did a lot of experiments testing that in nature. This was the 70s and the 80s, is old, even for me. But they did a lot of those experiments, a lot of those ex experiments. I would like to point out, therefore, that this, this, this uh, fixation with competition, uh, this uh, competition craziness, was not uh, just um, the, the it, it was a consequence, a logical consequence of how the theory was develop, developed. Once you realize that 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 the populations had the potential to grow without boundaries and the resources do not do that. That the, is, the, is the key insight of Malthus, isn't it? It was this realization. If, when you generalize this realization to ecology, you realize that competition is unavoidable as a logical consequence of this potential. This is, 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 is a similar way of thinking that led Darwin to come up with the idea of natural selection, isn't it? It was exactly the same work. Like there is the work by Malthus, the realization that resources do not grow exponentially, and therefore they will be limited, and then the best phenotypes will persist and reproduce. This will lead to differential reproduction or survival and then species will change through time. That was the reasoning. Here we are not focused on evolution, we are focused on ecology, but the, concept, but the, the reasoning is the same, it's based on the same work, literally the same work. So let's do experimental species removal experiments. And this is the classical system. You go to a hockey shore, you have these layers, layers of organisms, and this couldn't be generated just by abiotic effects, isn't it? Like some individuals here, they need more water. Over there, they are, they are not prone for desiccation, so that's okay, and, that's, and th that's why you have the layers. But there is another explanation. The alternative explanation is actually that at least some individuals could live here, but they, they are out-competed by those guys here. So what you do? You kill those guys, remove them, and what is the prediction? The other, the other species will just occupy the space. Exactly. So if there is competition, if it's competition, that's what's happening. If it was something abiotic, more boring, then you do that, and then it continues without if individuals. You will be colonizing by the same species. Turns out that, that in, in, at least for some of those layers, it's competition that is going on that is generating the spatial patterns that we observe. And competition is evident in plants, marine organism, organisms, especially sessile organisms, and vertebrates. But its odd, oddity is rare in herbivores. And this is, this is embarrassing. Because when people say, okay, wh what is the, I will ask a question, what is the most diverse group of animals in the world? in number of species. Yes, this is partially true. It's herbivore, uh, beetles that are herbivores, herbivore, herbivore beetles. The second most dominant group in terms of species are Lepidoptera, the butterfly group that feed upon plants. Not, not any Lepidoptera. Those that are not feeding on plants are much less diverse. 
And then if you go to, to Imenoptera, the wasps, bees, and ants, then it's the same. They're much more diverse if they feed on plants than if they feed on animals. Much more, much more diverse. So the most, dom most dominant groups in terms of species richness in the world does not show evidence, or at least a strong evidence, of competition that should be unavoidable by the exponential growth. That's embarrassing, isn't it? I would, only li would like to point out that negative results in science I seldom publish. So we have some, maybe this is over. Uh, the number, of the examples of competition looks uh, more common they should be because you just publish papers if competition occurs. Second, if you are studying competition in your grad school, you select systems that may have competi competition, isn't it? If I come up with you, what's your name? Isabel. Isabel, let's do a PhD project. Let's see if there is competition between whales and anemone fishes. If you look, if you look like a trap, it, it is a trap. <laughs> Run, because this will not work at all. So our, our hope here is those multi-species assemblages, the studies that focus on multiple species, like coral fish, you know? And then people try to describe the interactions of all pairwise species. Then you have a bunch of zeros, some negative, negative interactions, and so on. That's uh, the best uh, channel to ha actually have an estimate, at least in my opinion, uh, on the role of competition. So if com competition is common, just a, mo a moment, how does, the how does the biodiversity coexist in a world of compet competitors? Is it expected? Is it very common? Let's forget the herbivores for a moment. So how? How comp comp competition is prevented to lead to species extinction? Are you, hey, um, are you going to talk about the herbivores? No. Because Later, yeah. Okay, My, because okay. I was going to ask uh, okay. why. Why? Okay, let's yes. let's let's keep let's keep for for later, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, the key the key for for the coexistence among competitors right. is this word, this this this, this excerpt here, identical niches. To explore that, we need to do some simplifying assumptions. We are not doing like in the neutral theory, assuming that all individuals are equal. This is too much for me as a biologist. But let's assume that the individuals are equivalent within a species. And if this is true, then the second assumption is actually not an independent assumption, it's a consequence of the first one. There is no evolution, or at least no evolution driven by natural selection affect, affecting current ecological patterns, okay? So this is one example of theory that you can bring up in, the, in biology that, that is not following the mantra that uh, nothing in biology makes sense uh, unless it's on the light of evolution. That's a cool sentence. I totally agree. I work with evol evolutionary dynamics. I mean, I not totally agree. I work with evolutionary dynamics. It's a cool sentence, but that's not completely true. You can do theory, assuming that evolution is not shaping your system currently. All biomedical studies have a lot of advances without adding that. I'm not saying that adding that will not bring additional insights, and this is one of the cool areas in ecology right now, is to incorporate evolutionary processes to ecological dynamics, you know, what we call eco-evolutionary dynamics, but on a classical point of view, we make some progress without adding evolution, assuming that evolution is too slow. Essentially, is that, that that's our excuse. Evolution is too slow. It's important, uh, but in millions of years, not in decades. But this is not true. So let's do some predictions based on, on, the, on the principle, the Gauss principle. Uh, the principle that two competitors cannot coexist. So the first one is that potential competitors show niche differentiation. 
they cannot have exactly the same niche. I know that mathematically this would be highly unlikely that two species have exactly the same niche because the niche is multidimensional, but we are talking about a few axes here. Just the axes that by, a, by natural history, we guess they are important. So natural history is always there, gu guiding our, our intuition about the system. And to do so, let's go to New Guinea, a place that is incredible in terms of human diversity, biodiversity, and a place where natural selection generates crazy things like a kangaroo that goes on trees and moves on trees with the ability of a dog moving on trees. So if you go to New Guinea and you swim in the coast of New Guinea, you see a lot of anemone fishes. And anemone fishes, when they are not uh, moving around the ocean, trying to find their son that was lost uh, near Australia, they use it, uh, keep, close, keep close to the, their host, the anemones. So the clown fishes use anemones, and they are quite specific on that. They have a very narrow host repertory, let's say, coterie. So these two anemone fishes use the same anemone. So the prejudice is that they diverge in another important aspect of, niche, of the niche, and that's the case. They diverge in the habitats. Some one species use areas more close to the coast of the island, other goes more deep in the ocean. Okay? Shallow waters with more deep waters. This call, we call that dish differentiation, and in some situations we have an entire group of animals that is as almost as you have a, combi a particular combination of the two niche axes that give one species. And there is no room for any additional species here. Sometimes the same species use two combinations or more, but the thing is that you are filling this niche space, okay? The niche space is full, and we call this niche complementarity. This group covers the entire niche space, at least for these two axes. Another prediction it let's assume that there is no such a thing as niche differentiation. And the two species are overlapping those more important aspects of the niche. So I would predict that the spatial distribution of these species will be negatively correlated. So if one species is common in the space, the other species is rare, and, 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 and the opposite is true for the rest of the space. You know? One goes up, the other ones go down, okay? That is the most compelling evidence for competition. It's the easiest one to get, and is striking among, ac across many, many different groups. If you do that with birds, mammals, many insects, you find that. Two species that apparently are using similar resources, are living in similar conditions, they, are, they show a negative correlation in their, in their spatial distribution. But competition now is moved by traits, is guided by traits, shaped by traits. So if this is true, maybe if I am too similar to you, I use the same resources as you use, I live in the same conditions that you use, and so we will be particularly prone to show competition. Okay? Make sense? And if this is true, they might have a limit for the similarity uh, in terms of traits. Not, now now you're moving to traits. A limit in the similarity in, of the species that live in a given site. Make sense? Makes sense, isn't it? So let's go back to that plot that I briefly show in the first part of the, the lecture. Imagine that here we have six species. This is the regional pool of species, as we call. It's just a set of species, the list of species that you have in a big area, large area. And it's more similar the color of each species, more similar the traits. So the blue ones 
are all very similar. The green is different to everybody, and the two red ones are more similar to itself than to the other, to other species. So if this is, if competition is going on, is, is fundamentally driven by some particular traits, we may expect that locally it, there is what we call limiting similarity. Just a non-random subset of species are there. Okay? And this pattern is, is observed in nature. It's, it's in many systems. I would like to illustrate one that, that one of these uh, patterns associated with biological conservation. This is one of the cool stories of humani humanity, the way humans were able to colonize almost all islands in the Pacific through a time that Europeans were not able to get on Malta. That is just if you go blind in the ocean, in the Mediterranean Sea, you end up in Malta. But the Europeans were not able to do so. But those guys are, do, are able to colonize almost the entire set of thousands of islands across the Pacific Ocean. And when they did that, they created the first big wave of extinctions in these places. Diversity was destroyed in, in a huge way through this, this, this key human event. And in one way, so it's like we introduce rats. We, people, introduce rats all over the place, and rats eat everything, eggs, and destroy diversity. But we also take down trees to use the trees, and we, have to, uh, we deteriorate the ecosystems, the local ecosystems. If you deteriorate the ecosystems, you decrease the resources available to the species that live there, okay? And if this is true, you increase competition, okay? Just have less, less forest. And, and everybody's fighting for making a living. And so we come up with a, this, this prediction. There is a, this is a work by, by ecologists anal analyzing what we call subfossil data they are actually bones, because this was really recent. They are not fossils. They are bones of those birds there. In focus on birds, because birds have this cool aspect that if you look to the bill, you can guess what the bird feeds on. So this is guy here is a honey creeper. He gets nectar. That one with the large beak feed upon seeds. And the one that was, oh my god, it was, it was was not perfect the, the transmission here, but it's a very thin bill. It's an insectivorous bird, feeds on insects. So the prediction was that the extinction was non random. Just like for each different type of food resource, you have a survival. It was not a random set of species, and that's come up to be true. The evidence of support that, that idea that once the, the environment gets more degenerated, eroded by human activities, you increase competition, and then the extinction going on through competition. The, you come up with, at the end of the day, you keep one uh, nectarivorous bird, one or a few granivorous birds, and one and a few insectivorous birds. I'm, 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 I'm not aware of anybody testing that on cities, but I bet that this is true here. If you go to the walk in a park here in Sao Paulo, or in a, in a small square in Sao Paulo that has some trees, you always find like an insectivorous bird, the, the great Kiskaji, the Bentivy, or and then we say a granivorous bird, like this, some, what we call rolinhas, these doves, and then we find a frugivorous bird, the tanagers, the sanhaços, and so on. It's, it's not, a, not, at least not for me, don't, don't look like it's a random sample of the diversity of birds in the Atlantic forest. Okay, you, are, you have an overrepresentation of different diets. We have even birds of prey, like caracaras flying around. However, in other situations, we do not observe uh, limits for similarity. We quite, we quite all observe the opposite. It's not that everything can happen, it's just we have a map. 
because there is a, 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 a counterbalancing force that act against diversification. And this is the environment imposing selection to very particular combinations of traits, filtering out the diversity of traits. So like here, you have just a, just a subset of species more similar to surviving locally. This is what happens like if you move up to a mountain, that's what will happen. The subset of plants that are able to colonize mountains is, is not a random subset. They must have very specific physiological adaptations. They, for example, they should lead, in this case, in, Al in the Alps, with desiccation, with, with a lot of exposure to light, direct exposure to light, odd variation in temperatures, move to freezing to very uh, warm temperatures, particular combinations of soils. And the same is true for mangroves, for example. There is a very strong habitat filtering and in this case, competition is not strong enough to overcome this selection imposed by the habitat to filter out some, some species, sorting just a particular combination of species. Finally, uh, temporal variation in species composition is predicted by competition in the sense that competitive species may later arrive and substitute species that are arrive first in the community, generating, partially generating what we call ecological succession. It's just one component. In, uh, on Thursday, we will look more to, to ecological succession, but in terms of positive interactions among species. But here, one explanation is that the best competitors are the terrible uh, dispersers. So the, the, this, the good dispersers arrive first, occupy the system, and then the best competitor arrives later and substitute. And this creates a, a, a non-seasonal, continuous, and predicted, predictive change in diversity that we call ecological succession. But this is just part of the story. Positive interactions among species play a huge role in this process. This is a very complicated process. And we'll see more about that on Thursday. One fundamental question, though, uh, I said, like, for example, in some situations, the environment will overcome the effects of competition. In some situations, two species are able to compete, and they differentiate in one aspect of the niche, and they co can coexist. In other situations, no, they need to have some negative correlation in distributions. So when does co co competition matter? And to do so, we need math. We need to go back to models and think carefully what, what, what is the impact of competition in the system. So here we have two differential equations. Probably you guys already see that with Roberto uh, Krenke or in other courses. But the first one is just describing the change in the population in the, in the, in the abundance of the species one. The first part here is the Malthusian growth is a dense and independent growth. The Q1 minus N1 here is the intraspecific competition. The fact that the population alone will consume the resources and slow down the growth for the population. And then we add another species. I know that some of you guys already saw that and you saw that in the, in the course, but I would like to go to the, slowly here to understand some aspects of that. And specifically in this term here, the alpha, like the impact of the species two on the species one, the impact per capita. And this is something that you can estimate from the biological data. Originally, the way of you do that is just compute the overlap in the resource used by the two species. If you go back to the classical papers of limiting similarity, uh, by MacArthur and Levins in 1967 is exactly that what those guys did. They just compare the, the overlap among species. We can do some, some odd trick here, just a trick like a lion 
or a lioness actually weighs about three hyenas. So every time I add a, a lioness in, in a population, the lionesses are the one that matters because they are the one that do the hunting. Uh, it is, is, as you reduce the resources that could support three hyenas, and each hyena is one third of a lioness, so you need three hyenas to make a lion or a lioness. Of course, in nature, it's not like that. It's more complicated. You could do that directly in the resource use and measure the overlap of the, course, the curves, but this is a, just a, an approximation. And they are reducing, so we are, tra we are translating, bless you, we are translating uh, the population of species two in terms of how much the, the environment could support, could carry, of individuals of species one. Is that what we are doing? Is we are reducing the carrying capacity of the environment. And when does this teaching occur? You can do the math. So we'll go back here a bit. This is, this is, for, this is for most, for, for mo mostly for the people that has a biological background and was not used to equations like me. This look nasty, but they have good news. I, if, I got, if I remember correctly, you cannot solve analytically that. So there is no solution. And this is, this is liberty, isn't it? And when people come up with some nice, some cool sentence like, oh, I did a numerical, numerical solution, like what they are doing? They are just throwing numbers like crazy until this, make, until this become true. There is smart ways of doing so, but this is what a numerical solution needs, isn't it? You are just throwing numbers. Like my, my daughter tried to, I asked, well, how much is three plus five? And she just, is throwing numbers once you get, get that right, isn't it? But there is, so these are differential equations because they are relating to the rates of change in a variable with itself. Okay? So we, we do a trick here and transform that in something that when you are in the, in the school you could solve. We equal that to zero. You are not solving the equation in the sense that you are not describing how the abundance changed to time. This is what is solved a differential equation, if I remember correctly. But you are finding a situation in which the, the populations does not change, do not change. You are finding the equilibrium, the fixed points of the system. Okay? And once you, you, you equal that to zero, then it's algebra. You just play with these letters. And then you can find the combination of parameters that gives you the abundance of species one and species two in the fixed point, in the equilibria. And you need another restriction, isn't it? What, what, what you would like to impose? I'm interested in how two species that compete could coexist. So they need to coexist, and to they coexist, the abundances need to be higher than zero, right? Yes or no, people? Yes. So I impose that N1 and N2 need to be larger than zero. And then I find a combination of parameters that this is true, and the population does, does not change, okay? And if you do that, and this is just playing with, with that, you find this, this condition. Extinction occurs if the carrying capacity of species two times the alpha of two on one is larger than carrying capacity of one. And, or, and then there's the symmetrical definition for uh, the other species. One problem with this kind of result that I always get puzzled, some, sometimes you get puzzled, is that, oh, this is not uh, intuitive. Uh, thanks God, it's not intuitive. So if it was intuitive, I don't need math. I can just use my intuition. Is it? But in this particular case, it's, it bears some meaning that is easy to translate. Sometimes it will not be. But this, in this case, it is. Here, K, K1, 
is the carrying capacity of species one. In the absence of spe species two, this is the number of individuals that the, the environment support of species one. K2 times alpha 21 is describing the number of individuals of species two that can, that environment can support in isolation without species one, but in terms of individuals of species one, you are translating the number of individuals of species two, K2, in, in how much they weight over the population of species one, okay? So you have measured, this is, could be how many hyenas you have a place, and then you say, okay, but each three hyenas make one lion. And so this is we, uh, the number of hy hyenas in, in unities of lions that you have in that place. So if the hyenas are more abundant, the environment could support more hyenas measured in terms of lions, then the lions itself, the lions go, in, go extinct. In other words, if this, the effect of competition between species is stronger than the competition within a species, then you have extinction. But I would like to make one particular, uh, emphasize one particular point here. This is a population level effect of competition. This is not the per capita effect of competition. The per capita effect of competition is alpha, but you are multiplying by the carrying capacity. So one species of competitor could, in theory, lead the other competitor to, see, to extinction, even if the individual is a poor competitor compared to the individual of the second species, if the environment supports huge, a huge population of the first species. Mm -hmm. So it's the summit effect, it's the mass effect of that population, okay? So that's what that condition translates. Is intuitive in some sense, some sense. If the population is limited by itself, because the individuals of that population are fighting for resources, then the other ones play no role. If you get in agreement here, we stabilize earlier in terms of numbers, the numbers of the environment can support, then this will not lead us to extinction. However, there is a component that for me at least is not intuitive is that this effect is not a direct, a direct translated from the per capita competitive coefficient, but is this coefficient multiplied by the amount of individuals that the environment can support. And this may explain why some species can drive in competitors to extinction even without overlapping too much in their resource use. Because if I have a wild resource uh, width. If. My niche width if is huge and I overlap a bit with you, but for you this is your entire niche, then my impact on you could be huge and drive you to extinction. Okay? This will be always a population level effect. And then the species coexistence occur if intra-specific in, in, competition is higher than inter-specific competition. Competition within species is higher than competition between species, okay? There is another situation in which competition does not matter. Why well, this is not a driving force. I'm talking about here on carrying capacities, isn't it? But carrying capacities only matter if the resource is used, if the population grows grows, sorry, if the population grows enough to make the resource limiting. In some environments, that's not true. That's simply not true. The populations are not able to, to increase because there is some, uh, in the, in some source of, of mortality that is not related to density. In the, the density independent source of mortality that keep the population in check, like terrible winters. I have a friend that studied pollination in an island nearby Greenland, and this island has exactly 
42, and I'm not joking about the number, it's 42 days of life. And then everything freezes, and everybody dies. And then the next year, the sun come back, the eggs, it clothes, and then life begins. In a short, a so short period, maybe competition doesn't play any role because the resources are there. Like they have the flowers, the insects go use the flowers, pollinate the flowers, get the resource, mate, and die. There is no time. Okay, so if there is something in the environment that put the populations in check, this will prevent competition to be important. And then this may, co they may start, the, may, then this may tell us a, a little bit about the problem of herbivores that I mentioned just in the middle of this lecture. This is the work by John Alton. John Alton uh, was interested in plant insect inter interactions. So he described it for this particular plant, there's different parts of the plant. Then, then there is different ways an insect can use the plant. You can chew, suck, mine, that is just move within the leaves, creating that, that cool drawings in the line, or make galls, like tumors in the plants. And then he called for the same species of plants, the occurrence of different insects using parts of the plant in different ways. And then there is, this is something odd, because there is no miner in the US using that plant, but miners occur in New Guinea, you know, but not occur in London, in England. But gullers occur in London, in New Guinea, but not in the US. And then you, you realize there are combinations of resource use on that particular plant that in other places of the world maintain herbivores. But however, those combination, combinations are empty, empty, like here, like here, are empty in other parts of the world. This literally shows that there is a resource available, what Lawton call, call it empty niche. And then there is a lot of discussion. Uh, for me, a very boring discussion about the idea of empty niche because people say, okay, niche is a property of the individual. Niche is a property of a species. Come on, guys, niche does not exist. Niche is a metaphor. It's just an idea. You use if it's useful. And that's it. It's not, it's not something that is out there. Or oh, this is not truly the niche. What is truly the niche? This is just uh, concepts. And, uh, definitions are very important. I spend most of my two lectures, not most, but a lot of my lectures giving definitions, isn't it? Including dictionary definitions. Don't get me wrong, they are very important. But definitions in itself are used to make progress. Not, they should not be some, some jail that, that creates problem. Like here, for me, I could call this empty niche, or I could call, I don't know, Jonas or the name, but the fact is, is there is a combination of a lifestyle that insects do in a place and don't do in another place, which shows inequivocally there is a resource that are not being used. Why? I can make this question goes global pretty easy, and that's the question. Why is the word green? Herbivores are incompetent. There is a lot of food out there. I can see even in this area, in the middle of this town, I can see a lot of food and there is no insect destroying that. This is wrong. <laughs> this is not predicted. If competition is important, why you can see green? You fly over the Amazon, it's green. How this can be green? Where, is it, where are the herbivores? This looks like a, a children question. It's probably it, probably it is, but that, that's all what basic science is about, isn't it? Children questions. 
why the world is green? I will answer this question tomorrow. <laughs> so to finish, I would like to do a brief summary. Uh, we talk about competition, and then the key, the, or, 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 or the key divi division here is this: if the system, if competition is leading to selection or is not. If it is not leading to selection, you go to the neutral world, the neutral theory world, in which drift, dispersal, and speciation is, is uh, driving the ecological patterns in species richness and composition. And this can explain the species abundance distributions in empirical communities, which suggest that the fact that some species are rare, uh, just a few species are abundant, and most species are rare, are not something very com complicated to explain. Even without adding much biology, you can generate in huge details. I not went to the details in this talk, but in huge details, quantitative details, the distribution of, of species abundance. However, if selection is operating, then we start to get some very interesting patterns in ecological communities. You have niche differentiation, which means that the, the species, that coexist, species that coexist, they usually show some degree of non-overlap in the niche. We, if they do so a lot of overlap, they usually show a low occurrence, a negative correlation in the, the, in the spatial distribution. This could be also temporal distribution as well, but I didn't talk about sp temporal distribution here. And finally, in some situations, not always, but in some situations, this will lead to a limit of the similarity in that community. However, in some communities, the environmental conditions are so terrible, so picky, that they impose a species sorting that is so violent that there is no room to competition to actually generate this limiting similarity. I would like to end with some uh, ref references for future reading. There is this paper, I talk here independently about limiting similarity. I mention habitat filtering, and I talk about the stochastic, the, the ecological drift kind of dynamics, but you can actually quantify the relative contribution of each of it, of, of that. So here, people is to, is, was studying cyc cyclids in a lake in Africa, and they have different areas of the lake. And so each point here, so for each area of the lake, the relative contribution of these three different kind classes of process, stochastic, stochasticity that leads to our ecological drift, uptouch filtering, and limit, the, that is selection imposed by the environment and limiting similarity, which is selection imposed by competitors, the relative contributions of these different uh, processes uh, in shaping the local diversity of cyclades. So this is, when I say that we allow us to create a map, this is an example of a map. It's not that all oh, our cases will be like that. We will always be up that filtering or limiting similarity, but you can actually measure their nature and then try to understand why some places are essentially a game of luck, like here, and other places is essentially driven by, half of the pattern is driven by competition. In other places, what matters is the, the habitat filtering. Any question? No, guys? So we See so see you tomorrow two thirty. <laughs>